Hi, today we're going to have a look at eye histology, in this case a rabbit's eye. If you want to follow along, there's a digital version of the slide on the website. A link to the slide can be found in the video description. This is going to be quite a long video, so I plan to put chapters in it so you can skip to the part of the eye you want to know about, or you can watch the whole thing if you like. The eye is quite a complex structure, so let's break it down into a few compartments, starting with the cornea, moving on to the anterior chamber and iris, the posterior chamber and lens, and finally the retina and optic nerve. Let's start with the cornea. The cornea is derived from the skin. The primary optic vesicle that emanates from the brain during fetal development orchestrates the differentiation to cornea rather than haired skin. This can go wrong sometimes, as demonstrated by the development of dermoids, which are hairy growths on the cornea. Looking at the histology, we can see some similarities to the skin. There's an epithelium just here, with collagenous tissue underneath, looking quite similar to an avascular dermis without any adnexa. The corneal epithelium is six or seven cells thick. The basal layer of cells, so this layer just here, which sit on a basement membrane, contains stem cells that divide and renew the epithelium with a turnover time of about two weeks. As corneal epithelial cells advance towards the surface, their nuclei become more squamous and squashed, like these ones up here at the surface. If the epithelium is removed or damaged, you get a corneal ulcer, which has to be healed by the epithelial cells growing in from the edges, and this relies on the collagenous tissue underneath being able to support them. So you can imagine this takes quite a long time for large ulcers. The connective tissue underneath is the corneal stroma, the cell nuclei that you can see, for example, like whoop, this one here, or this one here, are fibrocytes. But in the cornea, they're called keratinocytes. You can see how the collagen fibres are arranged in parallel lines. There's clear space between them and some distortion because of the processing, but in the live animal, these fibres would be neatly aligned, creating a clear tissue that light can pass through. If we look at an electron microscope image of these collagen bundles, you can appreciate just how uniform and well orientated they are. This dark splodge here is a keratinocyte nucleus. Each dot in the tissue above is a uniform parallel collagen fibril. Compare the orientation of collagen bundles in the cornea to the disorganised mass of the collagen in the dermis. Also note how the cornea is completely avascular there are no blood vessels to get in the way. But this means that all nutrients have to arrive by diffusion from the anterior chamber, which is this clear space just behind the cornea. This is a problem for healing as blood vessels will have to grow in from the sides to supply inflammatory cells and substrates to clear up any damaged cells and make new tissue. While there aren't any blood vessels, there are lots of sensory nerves in the cornea, as you would expect, because poking yourself in the eye hurts. These are unmyelinated so as not to interfere with the corneal transparency, and they can be found in the layer just under the epithelium called the Bowman's layer. The final layer of the cornea is the corneal endothelium, so this blue layer just here. It's a single layer of cells. We can see the cell nuclei just here. There's one, there's another one, there's another one. And this forms the deep border of the cornea. These cells secrete a basement membrane called Desimet's membrane. This is the final barrier between the outside world and the anterior chamber of the eye. If Desimet's membrane is breached, then the eye is in pretty serious trouble. Behind the cornea is the anterior chamber of the eye. This is a space filled with a clear, watery fluid called aqueous humour. The anterior chamber is delimited by the cornea at the front and the iris at the back. The iris is part of a structure called the uvea. This is the vascular tunic of the eye. At the back of the eye, the uvea differentiates into the choroid, which we'll come on to later. In the front part of the eye, it forms the iris and also the ciliary body, which we can see just up here. But we'll come to those later on. The iris is the coloured part of the eye that you can see from the outside. If we take a closer look at the iris, you'll notice that there's no basement membrane or epithelium separating the anterior part of the iris from the anterior chamber. This means that whatever happens in the anterior chamber, be it inflammation or other naughty things like that, also happens in the iris. 
This loose layer of tissue here is called the iris stroma. It's formed of fibrocytes, melanocytes and endothelial cells forming small blood vessels. For example, I think that uh, these pink nuclei, for example this one, this one, get rid of the names there, these ones here, these are all fibrocytes. And then cells with darker cytoplasm like uh, the ones in blue here, here and here, and for example this one here, these are probably melanocytes. And then there's this structure here which looks, like, uh, which looks a lot like an endothelial cell forming a capillary. Your eye colour is defined by the density of pigment in this layer here. For example, those with heavily pigmented iris stroma will have brown eyes, and those with little pigment will have blue eyes. The posterior part of the iris is formed of two opposed epithelial layers. The deep layer forms the border of the posterior chamber of the eye. So this layer just here. It's heavily pigmented, so much so that we can't actually see any cellular detail in there. We might maybe be able to make out a couple of nuclei as these very faint areas here. Just below that, the other layer of the epithelium differentiates to form a layer of lightly pigmented myoepithelium. This is the dilator pupillae muscle. When it contracts, the iris will reduce in size, opening up the pupil. The dilator pupilla muscle has an antagonistic muscle which does the opposite, the constrictor pupillae muscle. The constrictor pupillae muscle is located mostly at the free edge of the iris and is also composed of smooth muscle. If we follow the iris back to the other end, then we encounter the ciliary body. But before we do that, let's have a quick look at the lens. The lens usually rests against the free edge of the iris, as we can see here, completing the separation of the anterior chamber from the posterior chamber. Grossly, the lens looks like a clear, hard, acellular structure, so you'll be surprised to find that it is a living tissue. The anterior part of the lens is covered by this beautiful cuboidal epithelium called the lens epithelium. If we look at the posterior lens, so all the way over here, we can see that there isn't any epithelium at all. Going back to the anterior lens, we can see the lens epithelium forms a basement membrane called the lens capsule just here. That's right, this epithelium is kind of the wrong way round than you'd expect. Usually the apical part of the epithelium, or the surface, is facing towards the empty space, not so with the lens. In this case, the cuboidal cells form the germinal layer. If we look at the equatorial parts of the lens, or the top and the bottom, we can see some more spindloid cells. These are differentiated lens epithelium. This cellular area of the lens is known as the nuclear bow. Gradually, these cells lose their organelles and nuclei to become lens fibres which you can see arranged concentrically within the lens itself. These fibres contain a water-soluble protein called crystalline, which increases the refractive index of the lens. Lens fibres condense over time to form the lens nucleus in the middle. Since lens fibres are made continually, they can accumulate in old age, forming opacities which can interfere with vision. The lens is made of hard material, so often shatters when it's cut for histology, as you can see has happened. In this case, it's kind of gone all over the place with some bits of lens fibres ending up over the cornea. The equatorial parts of the lens are attached to the ciliary body by suspensory ligaments. Maybe these little pink bits are some leftover suspensory ligaments, but I'm going to say that they're not really present in this section. When the ciliary body contracts, the lens changes shape which helps to focus light onto the retina. Making up the majority of the ciliary body is an area of smooth muscle which contracts or relaxes the ciliary body. Another component of the ciliary body is this papillary structure you can see at the front of the posterior chamber, just here. These are the ciliary processes. The ciliary processes are made up of two layers of epithelium. The deep layer is heavily pigmented and continuous with the iris, so if we follow it forward we can see it. Here it is. 
coming forward and, and making the deep layer of the iris epithelium. The superficial layer is non-pigmented. So we can see all of the cells very nicely and all of the cell nuclei as well. And this layer of epithelium, if we follow it forward, it doesn't progress anywhere further than the ciliary processes. Both of these deep and superficial layers of epithelium are actually derived from the retina. The function of the ciliary processes is to produce aqueous humor which enters the anterior chamber via the pupil. Aqueous humor maintains eye pressure, keeping the lens and cornea in place, as well as supplying nutrients to the avascular cornea. So if there's a way of producing aqueous humor, there must be a way of getting rid of it as well. Aqueous humor is drained from the anterior chamber, so here's the anterior chamber, is this open space here, via the canal of Schlem. This is an endothelial lined canal. Maybe we can make out a few nuclei of the endothelial cells, like uh, this one here. This endothelial lined canal runs all the way around the eye and is situated at the angle of the anterior chamber. Between the anterior chamber and the canal of Schlem, there is a fine collagenous trabecular meshwork, also lined by endothelium on this side where it uh, joins with the anterior chamber. The aqueous humor therefore has to cross both layers of endothelium and the trabecular collagen before draining into the canal of Schlem, into the venous system. Blockage of any part of this apparatus causes a buildup of humor, raising intraocular pressure resulting in a condition known as glaucoma. If we go back to the non-pigmented epithelium of the ciliary body, it's also responsible for production of the vitreous body, the gel-like substance that fills the posterior chamber of the eye. Unlike aqueous humour, the vitreous body does not constantly renew but is created during fetal development. As we begin to move backwards in the eye, we can see the layers of the ciliary body begin to change. The pigmented and non-pigmented epithelium begin to change shape, with the non-pigmented epithelium becoming more columnar. Underneath, the smooth muscle of the ciliary body becomes fibrous tissue mixed with pigmented cells. Below that, there's a dense jumble of collagenous tissue. Further back in the eye, the epithelium is joined by more cell layers as we begin to move into the retina. So let's jump right to the back of the eye and examine each of these layers in turn. Here we can make out three layers. The retina, the choroid, and the sclera. If we look at each of these in turn, we can start with the retina. The retina is the light-sensitive part of the eye. This is where all the photoreceptor magic and transmission to the brain happens. There are three cell types in the retina. Neurons, pigmented epithelial cells, and neuron support cells. Just a few points before we start to go through all of these layers of the retina. The terms inner and outer refer to how close the layer is to the posterior chamber, which we can see as this clear space here. And the second point is that there tend to be alternating layers of cell nuclei and anuclear structures. It's important to remember which neurons have their nuclei in which layer and what connections they make in the overlying anuclear layers. Starting with the outermost layer, so the layer furthest from the posterior chamber, the layers and their contents are number one, the pigmented cells. These are known as the retinal pigmented epithelium. These epithelial cells are separated from the choroid by Bruch's membrane, which we can see as this thin pink line here. On the apical surface, we can see the pigment, so this dark staining black spots here, and villi extending up into the next layer. The next layer is all of this one here, so between the pigmented epithelium and this kind of slightly pink dark line here. This is the photoreceptor layer. These pink torpedo-like structures are the photoreceptors of the rods and cones. I think we can tell them apart on this section. These long, thin, pink things are probably rods, and the shorter, fatter ones are cones. The cones are responsible for colour differentiation and are less numerous. Largely invisible, but surrounding these photoreceptors is cytoplasm from a special cell type called the Muller cells. These cells are neuroglia, which provides structural support and maintain a favorable environment around the neural cells. 
The photoreceptor layer is separated from the next layer by this thin eosinophilic line that we mentioned before. This is the outer limiting membrane. It's not a true membrane, but represents intercellular junctions between photoreceptors and the Muller cells. The next layer up is the outer nuclear layer. This is formed of the cell bodies and nuclei of the rods, cones and Muller cells. The next layer is acellular, or well, it's just without nuclei, and this is called the outer plexiform layer. These are the axons from the photoreceptor cells, which synapse with dendrites from integrating neurons. The next layer up is the inner nuclear layer. As you'd expect, it contains the cell bodies of the integrating neurons that were putting their dendrites out into the outer plexiform layer. Next up, there's the inner plexiform layer. This contains axons from the integrating neurons forming synapses with dendrites from the retinal ganglion cells. So you won't be surprised to hear that the next layer up is these lovely big neural cells this is the ganglion cell layer and contains the cell bodies of the retinal ganglion cells. And then the final layer, just above that, are the optic nerve fibres. This layer contains the axons of the retinal ganglion cells, which travel in the optic nerve to the brain. You'll notice that uh, these fibres are non-myelinated. Again, that's to prevent interference with light, which has to pass through all of these layers to reach the photoreceptors before it's um, detected. Finally, before we move on to the optic nerve, there is the inner limiting membrane which separates the vitreous or the posterior chamber of the eye and the retina. As we follow these nerve fibers down, we can see a few blood vessels like this one here. And eventually we will reach the optic nerve Within the optic nerve, these nerve fibres then become myelinated and will travel straight to the CNS. The area where the optic nerve enters the retina is called the optic disc. You'll notice that there's no uh, photoreceptor cells here, which means that this part of the back of the eye cannot detect light. The other large layers that we mentioned forming the back of the eye are less complex. Underneath the retina is the choroid. This is mainly formed of pigmented cells supported by fibrovascular stroma. So we can see the dark pigmented cells. There's a blood vessel here and here, another little blood vessel here. And then in amongst the pigmented cells, there's probably some fibrocytes, maybe this one here, that one there as well. The function of the blood vessels is to supply nutrients to the outer layer of the retina. The function of the pigment is to absorb light that passes through the retina to stop it from bouncing around within the eye too much. In nocturnal animals, the most superficial part of the choroid will be the tapetum lucidum, a reflective layer that can redirect light towards the retina and maximise light absorption. There should be one in this rabbit, and it's probably these cells here, just under the retinal pigmented epithelium. But on the histology, it's not as spectacular as it is grossly or in nocturnal photography where it can be seen reflecting back the flash of the camera. The final collagenous layer is the sclera. This is a continuation of the cornea, but as you can see, the collagen fibres are not so nicely arranged and therefore it isn't transparent. This layer is responsible for the white colour of the eye globe. So that's a quick whiz through the histology of the eye. If you're still watching at this point, well done. Perhaps you found this video helpful and would consider subscribing or giving this video a like. If you want some more content on normal histology, you can check out this video on blood vessels. Or head over to the channel page where there should be a series on normal histology of a wide variety of other animals. Thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.